Hello everyone, it's Davey Mooney here at the University of North Texas where I run the jazz guitar program. I'm a Benedetto artist, Sunnyside Records artist. I got my Sunnyside catalog up here, if you can see with the glare. The latest is uh, Live at National Sawdust. I've got three other ones. Personalizing Jazz Vocabulary, my new, uh, new, it's not new. <laughs> uh, my Mel Bay book. Um, I have a new one in the works though. That, uh, just getting ready to record the uh, examples for. And uh, shout out to Jazz Guitar today, as always, for helping me get these videos out into the universe. And uh, we're getting ready over here at uh, University of North Texas to start up classes again next week. Actually, I don't know when you'll be watching this video, but from where I, from where I sit right now, it's about a week out. And I uh, have uh, my improv class, Advanced Jazz Improv. Um, and I like to kick it off every semester with a Coltrane uh, changes tune, you know, a tune that uses the cycle uh, of harmony that he used on Giant Steps, Countdown, 26-2, and also Satellite, which I'm going to talk about today. I kind of think of those as the big four, and then Central Park West is so beautiful, it's like the ballad version, but, you know, he put these changes on a lot of songs, especially on the record uh, Coltrane Sound, which is, uh, I think, one of one of his masterpieces. I mean, he has so many, uh, but uh, it's interesting too because it's a, a you know before he assembled his classic quartet, and the version of Satellite on that album has uh, it's just a trio. Like, there's no piano. I don't know if the piano was like, <laughs> forget this, because on 26-2 you've got McCoy Tyner on there, but this one is Steve Davis and Elvin and uh, Coltrane, and you know I love it. It's so good. Uh, he's super accurate with uh, the chords, as always. But at the same time, I feel like the time is kind of loosey-goosey, his eighth note feel. I like it, it's like real slippery. Maybe looking forward to uh, the future, the Coltrane uh, core classic quartet, where the time was a little more uh, elastic. Although, you know, always in the pocket. But the pocket was stretched a bit, if you will. So anyway, so talk about the harmony of this tune. So, you know, it goes through similar cycle, uh, as 26-2, Giant Steps, Countdown, etc. Um, this one is based on how high the moon follows that structure and in, in the way that uh, Countdown follows uh, Tune Up, it's basic structure. So, you know, where how high the moon is, you know, G major, you know, somewhere there's music, and then a 2-5 to F. I've changed the tune, and a 2-5 to E flat, and you have the structure where then it goes, G minor, then G major, and turns around in G again, and then the second half of the song, it's like an A, B, A, A, C form of How High the Moon. You got that G major, 2-5 to F, 2-5 to E flat, and then the second time, it goes to G major, and then a 4 minor, a C minor, and then a 3-6, 2-5. Ornithology is also based on that. Uh, chord progression. Um, and Train, of course, <laughs> instead of just two bars of G major, he takes it through his cycle. So he goes G major, B flat 7, E flat major, F sharp 7, B major, D7, and then to G minor, because then he arrives at the 2-5 to F that you have in the actual How High the Moon song. So he just expands those uh, that G major to G minor thing that you get in How High the Moon with his, his cycle of keys going from G major to E flat major to B major in fact in G minor then there's a 2-5 so Chet Atkins were playing it maybe or Lenny Bro F major A flat 7 D flat E7 A major C7 F minor that 2 5 to E flat. So uh, yeah, it's, it's the structure of How High the Moon just with a lot of a lot of chord thrown in there. So in the F uh, part that's in F, you get, go from F major to D flat major to A major, back to F minor, 2 5 to E flat. And the next part, you get a little break <laughs> in this song, sort of, uh, or you think you do, because then he, does, he follows the uh, chords from How High the Moon for a minute. So he's got E flat, 2-5 to G minor, 2-5. Actually, I think he, they don't actually do a 2-5. I 
uh, before the G major, if you listen to the to the record. But theoretically, you could be so your E flat, two five to G minor, two five to G major, and you think you're gonna be cool here, but then he goes, uh, he does the same cycle to get back to the get back to the beginning. So. Same, same idea. And the second half of the song follows the structure of how high the moon, so you go to get to G major that time instead of G minor. And then the C minor again, but instead of doing like a, a three, six, two, five turnaround in uh, G like they do in How High the Moon and uh, Ornithology. He goes to a D sus, uh, just D7 sus for eight bars, which is nice. That's a little break that you get in this song. <laughs> you get a little interlude um, of just D7 sus where you can play, you know. D mixolydian or, or whatever you like, play some diminished ideas. So you resolve to uh, back to G. So again, just to go through the chords, G major, B flat 7, E flat major, F sharp 7, B major, D7, G minor, C7. That's the first four bars. <laughs> F major, A flat 7, D flat major, E7, A major, C7, F minor, B flat 7. That's the next four bars. And then a little break in the harmonic rhythm, but not much. You get a whole bar of E flat, minor 2, 5 to G minor. And you can just stay on G minor, or you can do a 2-5 to G major, then a 2-5 to E flat, E flat, F sharp 7, B major, D7, and then you repeat the second half, G major, B flat 7, E flat 7, F sharp 7, B major, D7, G minor, C7, F major, A flat 7, D flat, major, E7, A major, C7, F minor, B flat 7. So, you know, uh, my playing strategy, <laughs> improvising strategy for this tune is very similar, not identical, to what I do on 26-2 or count, and I kind of have a couple little uh, uh, techniques, uh, I wouldn't call them tricks, they're not very tricky, but one thing, uh, this tune actually was what led me to formulate this concept, the idea of using, playing off of common tones, or I like to call them negative guide tones. And if you just look at the melody of the song, which we haven't talked about yet, he goes, uh, and I remember thinking, like, wow, that's really interesting that he's kind of just playing, at, at the beginning anyway, he's playing off of the fact that this little toggle between D and D sharp. So like D works on G major, it works on B flat seven, it works on E flat major seven. And then on F sharp seven, it doesn't work. But you just go up a half step and then you're kind of cool for a second for F sharp seven and B major. But then when the D seven comes, you have to go back down to D or, you know, up to E or something. Um, so you're always, it's that uh, <laughs> adage, I don't know, I heard that this was a, Neil Young said this, I don't know, it's one of those quotes that I don't know where it came from, but the idea is you're always one fret away from the right note, <laughs> which is true, but you're also one fret away from the wrong note, so, you yeah. know. I mean, he goes up to F sharp there, but for, you know, from an improvising perspective, you could, you could go... I'm just going, I'm not only playing those notes, but I'm using those notes like in, in the first four bars, 
this toggle between D and D sharp as uh, you know guide tones <laughs> again negative guide tones and that they don't move really I mean for a lot of the time I'm looking for the notes that are similar because the chords move so so quickly it's kind of like reverse psychology with the harmony so I could go I could go D and D sharp and I wrote up some exercises for uh, my students I don't know if I'll quote them exactly but the idea that yeah D and you could say so for the first one bars you could take D and D sharp So you can do the same thing in the next four bars, but if you wanted to pick a different chord tone, so this is the you know the fifth of G. What if we took like uh, on the F major part, so on the second four bars, if we took the major seven like of F, so if you took a uh, toggle between E and F, you'll see so go. Slightly different uh, <laughs> little toggle, but E natural, F, F, E natural, E natural, E natural, F. You see what I mean? You're always <laughs> only one fret away, even while the chords are, are jumping in thirds, minor thirds, major thirds, and things like that. So. And it helps me. As a guitar player, too, uh, with my uh, idea of playing in positions and really shed, as this is what my new book is about, the idea that you would practice these tunes uh, in one area of the neck. Make sure you can get all the chords in this area before you move to another one. Um, and eventually, you know, you can move fluidly from one area to another, but you want to identify where everything is, where the arpeggios are, um, scales to a certain extent, although this goes by so fast that scales are... <laughs> I mean, in the last eight bars, it's nice you get a little break. You can, you can scale out a little bit. But so that's so that you can do the major seven. If we take like the nine, A, A natural, and go from A to B to B flat or A to A sharp. So you could have on the G, you could have an A natural, and then on the B flat seven, B flat, which is the root. And then you can stay on B flat, and harmonically, B flat is A sharp, and then A again for the D seven. It's the same idea of you're, you're one fret away from <laughs> where you need to be at all times. You get the idea. Um, and again, that comes from uh, really just listening to the, the melody of that song and realizing, huh, you know, he doesn't really move. The melody moves in a different harmonic rhythm than the chords. Um, and this is also, just to, to say a couple more things about the song, it's also, uh, you know, the chords I'm talking about, uh, I said at the beginning of this video that, it, you know, it's G major, B flat 7, E flat major 7, F sharp 7, etc. But the bass line moves down in whole steps, so you get this. You get some cool inversions so that there's this contrary motion, or the, the motion of the melody and the motion of the bass and the motion of, of the harmony um, are kind of oblique, maybe would be a better term. They don't always go the same way, and they're, they they diverge at cool cool points. So when you have a, a version with no piano, you still get a, a lot of cool sort of har uh, harmony and counterpoint. You know. And uh, beyond the negative guide tones, common tones idea, I do I'd like to think about. Uh, what I said, I believe, in my videos in Countdown in 26.2, the idea of Barry Harris has of anticipating the dominance, you know, the idea that you can anticipate the B-flat 7, and then when you get to the E-flat major, you can anticipate the F-sharp. Um, I don't know why it works, but it seems to work on this, so you can like... In, in the video he does on, on Giant Steps, which is I urge everyone to watch because it's really funny too, <laughs> just because he's so irascible and brilliant. Um, but he talks about how in Giant Steps you can only play one beat with B before you have to get to D7. And uh, I'm not that literal with it, um, but I do feel like you can get away with anticipating the dominant chords. Um, 
a bit every now and then so you don't get behind the changes. So anyway, I'm going to uh, play on this tune and try to uh, use some of these concepts and, and get through it because it's a, it's a monster. It's a beast of a song, but very beautiful too. So hope you enjoy it. Thanks. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. 